Welcome to Jason Live. I'm Haley Nelson, and we are back with our STEM career series where we learn about careers in science, technology, engineering, and math from role models in those fields. Today's STEM role model is Dr. Lee Selznick. Lee is a neurosurgeon at Virginia Brain and Spine Center, and he diagnoses and he operates on patients with problems with their brains, spines, and peripheral nerves, and he helps them get back to their normal lives that would otherwise be disabling and, and have other issues. So we are going to learn all about our STEM role model and more when we connect with Lee in just a moment. But first, I want to remind you that today's event is live and interactive. So below this video window, you'll see a place where you can ask questions. And we are going to try to get to as many of you as possible. So keep an ear out for your name and your question. All right, it's time to say hello to Lee. Welcome, thank you for joining us. Oh, thank you, glad to be here. Oh, we are so excited. We have seen so much of your work already online, so let's just dive right in. Let's start with the basics. What is a neurosurgeon? So a neurosurgeon is a doctor who operates on patients with problems in the brain, the spine, and the peripheral nerves. So we see patients in the office, and we gotta hear their story and, and find out what their symptoms are and try and uh, see how it fits with their anatomy and figure out what the problem is. We have a question that came from Bella. She's asking, what does it feel like to be the person in charge of all your patients' lives? When you're doing surgery, you can choose, <laughs> you can choose to kill them or fix them. How does that pressure affect you? Well, it, it, it's a lot of pressure, and generally I don't choose to kill my patients, obviously. Um, our goal is to keep them alive and, and to improve their lives. And the responsibility is it's a gradual progression. If I thought of it when I was in high school, you'd think, how in the world can you take that kind of pressure? But just like anything else, you learn and learn every day, and you get better and you get more confident, and ultimately you become the expert. So at this point, I'm very confident in what I do, and uh, when I choose to operate on someone, I know I'll be helping them with extremely low risk of, of ever hurting anyone. Well, let's just keep on going here. So could you describe kind of what you do on a day-to-day -day basis? All right, so my work week is um, split um, between spending time in the office and then operating at the hospital. So in the office, I see patients, some follow-up and some new, um, um, patients with problems, mostly spine and some brain and some peripheral nerve. And like I said, we kind of hear their story. We examine them to try and find any signs that can clue us into the anatomy. We review imaging studies, such as MRIs and CAT scans that can look inside someone's body and, and look at the brain, look at the spine see the pathology, and then come up with a plan. And then the rest of the work week, which is generally Wednesdays and Thursdays for me, um, operating on those patients, uh, um, take them to the operating room and trying to fix the problem. Wow. That's kind of amazing that you're able to just diagnose and then go in and fix. <laughs> we have another uh, question from, let's see, Lacanellis class, it says. Uh, dear Dr. Selznick, is it true that if you apply stem cells onto the part of the brain that is affected by Parkinson's disease, it stops the patient from shaking? Could this be a cure? Unfortunately, not yet, but there's a lot of research on that. Um, we're learning more and more in the labs um, in terms of what these stem cells can do, how they can divide and become more mature functioning neurons. Right now, we can't get them to integrate very well into the already established brain. Um, there's a ton of research um, regarding this, so maybe by the time any, some of you guys are doctors, that's definitely a possibility. Brooke Hoffer wonders, what does it look like when you get inside the brain? Hmm. Um, well, you can go online and see that. Um, it's um, pretty much what you expect, but it's, it's, it's unlike trauma, it's very well controlled. Okay, So there's not a lot of bleeding. Um, it's really pristine and, and what I find kind of a remarkable, amazing, and beautiful anatomy. Um, so a little bit awe-inspiring, especially the first time you see it. Well, we have a question from, this is Hailbug12, asking, what was it like the first time you operated on a fully live brain? Hmm. Uh, it, it was scary, obviously, but like I said, it's, it's a transition. So we go through many years of training. And it's kind of like how a baby learns how to walk. They don't just stand up and go on their own the first time. They have people holding your hand, their hands and, and uh, make sure that it's done safely. So we start off as medical students, mostly observing. When we're residents, we start with some basic things and, and gain more responsibility over the years. So by the time that the responsibility is in your own hands, you're confident in what you're doing. 
Let's go right to Claudia. She's wondering, what is the most exciting news in Alzheimer's tre treatment and research? Huh, that's a good question. I guess there, I mean, there's, there's a lot. I'm, I'm, def I'm not the expert. Unfortunately, right now, there's not a lot of surgery for Alzheimer's. Um, that goes back to maybe the stem cell question we had before. I think just like for Parkinson's, um, there's a potential role for stem cells with Alzheimer's and, and regenerative medicine. Um, so right now in the short term, um, there isn't anything I can think of that's going to be groundbreaking, but that's where the true geniuses of the field are doing the research and pushing the field forward. Well, Ms. Cole's class is wondering what's the hardest and or most difficult surgery that you had to perform? Hmm. I think the most difficult surgeries are, are aneurysm surgeries. So aneurysms are little balloon dilations within blood vessels. And what happens with their normal blood pressure, those little balloons get very thin and keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and then eventually they can pop. And that's obviously life-threatening. You get a big hemorrhage or bleed into the brain. So we'll see patients that come to the hospital after something's bled, and um, it stops on its own, and we have to operate and prevent it from bleeding again. So that, of all things, is the closest analogy I can think of. It's almost like a ticking time bomb um, when you're operating on it and trying to diffuse it. Um, so, and again, it's, it takes a lot of skill and a lot of time, but ultimately you get good at it and confident, and you help people. Related to that, we have a question that is, what is one surgery that you've never done but want to do badly? Ha! Oh, my goodness. I don't know if I've ever thought about that one. Um, but want to do. Uh, they say like that all the time on TV dramas, you know. Yes. So. <laughs> um, unrelated to neurosurgery, and when in training you kind of see the whole gamut. You pretty much see most of the things. You don't end up doing everything. Um, but I was always fascinated with reconstructive plastic surgery. Mm -hmm. Um, and so taking children that have deformities mm -hmm. and more or less giving them a new appearance and, and giving them their life back that way. I think it's very artistic and creative, um, and I was always very fascinated um, by that. And that's something I never got to do, and I think if I wasn't a brain surgeon, I think I probably would have pursued that. Can, can you go back and just do them both? <laughs> no. There's no time. There's just no time. There's a, there's a lot of work to get where I am. Yeah. So going back there again, I tell you, my wife would kill me. <laughs> Well, we have Ezra and Eric. They're asking, how would you cure brain cancer? Um, that's another great question. Um, I, unfortunately, I don't have the answer for that one. Quite honestly, I think the most exciting research for cancer, um, and, and specifically brain cancer, is what's called immunotherapy, teaching our own bodies to kill the cancers. So our immune system is built to attack anything foreign to the body. Cancer is foreign. And we can, and there's lots of research that you can identify the cancer cell separate from your own cells and attack it. There's just lots of little hurdles. It's all um, technical hurdles in terms of how to get those cells to the tumor cells, how to um, specifically apply it to the brain um, and not damage the normal brain. But there's a ton of research regarding this, and I think that's the next breakthrough for, for cancer research. There's so much we don't know. <laughs> Correct. Um, we have uh, another question that says, does it ever feel like you're going to do something wrong when you start? Hmm. Um, not when I start, but sometimes you get surprises when you're in there. Okay, so you can have sometimes um, uh, the surgeries don't go as planned, and that's a nice thing. I'm in a group practice, so I got four other neurosurgeons that work with me. We all have our own backgrounds and, and little expertise. Um, so if I get into a case that I'm not confident with or I think I could use a little help, then I can phone a friend and uh, have him come in. And, um, and then we can work it out together. What kind of technology do you use that is relatively new that maybe we wouldn't know about? Yeah. Um, the, the most amazing thing, quite honestly, is how advanced computers have gotten. Uh, computers and neuroimaging. So currently we can make three-dimensional models of the brain. So if you review one of my epilepsy cases, so when we do epilepsy, um, we need to locate where a patient's seizures are coming from. What's, what, what epilepsy is and what seizures are, it's a cluster of neurons that are firing abnormally and they spread through the entire brain in an uncontrolled fashion. 
And there's a number of things we need to do to find specifically where those seizures are. And uh, so what we can do is we can put electrodes directly on the surface of the brain, wait for them to have seizures, see where um, the electrode is relative to the seizures, and then try and remove that area. Um, and instead of just going in blindly, we can actually create three-dimensional models of the brain, of the electrodes, of the potential seizure focus, and have a complete game plan before we actually operate. That is incredible. Really mm -hmm. Things like you just and being able to have a plan and to be able to see something must be a game changer for you. Yeah. Yeah. Not only it lets us limit the size of the incision. So before we had to make large incisions because we didn't know exactly where things would be. Now we can do tailored small incisions. Um, the other thing is we can do it safer. Sometimes there's a little blood vessels or nerves or what's called functional cortex, parts of the brain that we know are anatomically are going to cause problems with strength or, or language that we can actually see and see whether it's in front of the lesion, behind the lesion, below it, and come up with a plan of how to approach lesion without damaging these normal structures. We have two questions in the queue wondering, is your job hard, and how much patience do you need for your work? Yeah. Well, number one, I'd say yes, the job is hard. I'd say most jobs are hard, okay? But if you enjoy what you're doing, um, it's definitely worth it. Um, and then patience, you need a lot of patience. You can't rush um, the education, the training. You can't rush the cases. You, you have to really take your time. That's more important than anything. Um, so uh, those are both very good questions and both very relevant to what I do. Here's one I'm sure you've gotten before. I promise I didn't write it myself. Does the show Grey's Anatomy actually depict what it's like working as a surgeon? Um, no, and, and, and it's a little bit upsetting to me to see this. Uh, the neurosurgeon that they have, um, the outcomes are not nearly as good as they should be. Um, so, wow. they, yeah, they over-dramatize um, neurosurgery and make it look very scary, which mm -hmm. from the outside world obviously it is, but it's exquisitely rare for anybody to die from anything that I do. Um, it's not any more than probably any other surgery in terms of life and death, with rare exceptions such as traumas and someone who was already in jeopardy prior to going to the operating room. Um, so I remember watching, I watched a couple of seasons, and he would take what would be a relatively simple case, and the patient would die. And, and, and uh, it's very unfortunate on TV, tragic in real life, and fortunately it rarely happens. All right, everybody out there, spread the word. Brain <laughs> surgery? Most of the time, not as dramatic as yeah. you see on TV. Okay, I'm going to tell everybody I know. Um, what is the, we have another question, what is the youngest patient you've ever done surgery on? Uh, believe it or not, in training, um, babies. Um, there are babies born with um, uh, genetic or congenital anomalies that can cause trouble very early on. Um, there's something called hydrocephalus, where they actually get fluid buildup in the brain. That's very common, especially in premature babies, so we'd actually do even procedures on premature babies. And I did a um, rotation at Children's Hospital in uh, Philadelphia, and there was actually a neurosurgeon operating in utero wow. while they were pregnant, fixing children that had um, uh, problems called myelomeningocele, an abnormality of the, the spinal cord. So from the beginning of life. Goodness, they get to touch the babies before the baby is born. It's amazing. Yep. Um, we have another surgery question. What is the craziest surgery you've ever done? Well, there's probably a lot, but one that I find very fascinating are patients that have what are called meningiomas. Meningiomas are benign, meaning they aren't cancers, mm -hmm. um, but they are tumors or growths, and, and they occur on the lining around the brain, and they grow slowly. They grow about one to two millimeters per year on average. And these things can grow for decades. And the brain is amazing enough that if something grows slowly, it can compensate and deal with it until it reaches its breaking point. And so I've had a couple of patients that more or less had grapefruit-sized tumors in their head. And essentially, they present with several months only of just not being themselves. You know, I have this one patient. He was a mechanic, very diligent, very good worker, good husband. Um, and he wasn't himself, he started sleeping more, he didn't care, he didn't do a good job, um, was about to get fired, 
Um, and then ultimately uh, went to his doctor, got a scan, and he had a massive meningioma. And that was definitely the explanation for what was going on. Is that like the picture that we, we have? That, yeah, just like that. That's, that's him. And you can see this. You don't have to be a neurosurgeon to see where the problem is. Okay, mm -hmm. He's got this big, bright tumor in the middle of his brain, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, and amazing, patients can make full recoveries with this, too. So we take it out. The brain goes back to where it was. There's usually a little space left over. Looks um, like a big space. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it doesn't necessarily look the same. Okay. But he, he became himself again. Got back to work and resumed his life without any problems. That's amazing. Well, just kind of in general, what are some of the things you're working on? All all kinds of you're working on peripheral nerves and the spine and the brain. How do those things present? Like, what are you when you do the surgery? What kinds of behaviors are you fixing? Well, for this, most of what we do now, where I am, it's mostly spine. So it's usually pain. So someone will have a new arm pain or a new leg pain, and it turns out there's a nerve being pinched. And depending on where that pain is, we can anatomically figure where it is. Um, for the brain, it's usually um, headaches are very common. Unfortunately. Headaches in general are very common, so I don't want to scare anybody. If you have headaches, don't think you have a brain tumor. That's number one million on the list. Okay. okay. So um, usually it's headache with other neurologic symptoms. So they'll start to get weak on one side. They'll have numbness on one side. They'll have a seizure, something of that nature. Um, so that's 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 generally it's 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 usually a pain or neurologic symptom. Okay. So when they walk out of there, they're feeling better. Hopefully. In some, in some kind of pain before, and then they start to yeah. feel happy. Fortunately, if we can figure out where the problem is, depending on what it is, um, we usually can fix it and make it better. There is the potential for permanent nerve damage, um, and especially if it's the spinal cord. If the spinal cord gets damaged, it often doesn't recover. And we have another question that's coming in wondering, what does the computer behind you say? Maybe you can talk a little bit more about that. So that's a that's a talk that that I that I have um, that I did. I do a number of talks. I, I, I kind of lecture locally, try and teach the community about what we do. Um, and we have a, some schools um, uh, for nursing and physician assistants around here to educate um, the the support staff. And so that's an epilepsy talk that I do. Um, so that's just some pictures of some brains with some electrical um, circuitry going around it. And I have this great picture. It was taken off the web. Oh, Oh, he dropped. Okay, we're having a little bit of technical difficulty. We just lost Dr. Selznick, but he's going to pop on back any second. This is kind of amazing to see how much of a difference that he can make in people's lives from just hearing about their symptoms, running a few tests, and then immediately scheduling a surgery figuring out exactly where electrodes need to be placed for epilepsy surgery, I'm absolutely blown away. Because this is the type of thing that you would see on television, and you would see all this different technology being used in order to be able to see someone inside someone's body before you even have to go in and fix anything. So you have a full scope of knowing what to do. And we were speaking before the interview started a little bit about not just being able to see inside the body, but there are some surgeons that are um, mapping tumors so that they can see a 3D image and even being able to look at that image to decide where things go and even being able to 3D print an image of a tumor. So you can hold it in your hand as a surgeon and look at it, and you can look, you can see where the veins are, you can see of where the blood vessels are, so that you know what to avoid, what to do, and what not to do. So I am just absolutely thrilled. Hey, that. sorry about that. Oh, hey! My, my computer went to sleep without warning me. <laughs> well, that's good. I was just actually telling telling everybody about what we were talking about before with taking the 3D image and how you were saying that there are some um, there are some people who are 3D printing tumors yeah. to be able to look at them. I thought that it's was like aneurysms. The aneurysms especially, it's really neat because then you can see all the anatomy, figure out how you need to clip it um, safely. Yeah. Wow. Well, we have more questions coming in uh, from the king of brains. 
Yeah. Oh, ooh, this is a question kind of relating to tools. And, you know, I know a lot of people are wondering about this. Do you have to open the skull when you do brain surgery? Believe it or not, you don't have to. Um, I, we, I do. Um, so oftentimes, yeah, you do what's called a craniotomy. You use special um, drills to, to, to remove sections of the bone that you then put back on afterwards. But believe it or not, there's a, a lot of there's several types of surgeries that you can do through the nose, um, and then you just drill through the back of the nose without any incisions, um, and uh, that actually, um, in back in my training, we took out what were called pituitary tumors, mm -hmm. uh, the pituitary gland that way, and now um, there's surgeons that are pushing the boundaries and expanding the exposures and removing meningiomas like we just talked about, clipping aneurysms and uh, doing really complex surgeries just all through the nose. Wow. I, and I never thought about that, like having a totally non-invasive <laughs> no scar. Um, we have a comment, uh, is it true you braid the hair of a patient before surgery? Um, that I do for hair sparing procedures, especially for women. Um, so I, a lot of how people do after the surgery is really just how they cope with, with, with what's going on. You know, obviously someone has to have surgery on their brain. It's a very stressful situation and, and, um, and the whole experience is important, not just what happens during the surgery. And what the patient sees, actually, the only thing they get to experience is after the surgery, how they feel and how they look. Um, so especially um, for the epilepsy surgery, I do a lot of teenage girls and that's even more of a factor. And so we try and spare the hair and braid it nicely and, 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 and make them look presentable. I had I had never heard of that. That's kind of mm -hmm. awesome, and it probably helps too that you're a very positive person mm -hmm. and have a lot of confidence what you do because that must carry over into their whole experience. Yeah, without a doubt, and that that really plays into how patients do in general. Mm -hmm. uh, just coping skills is very important. So someone with the same symptoms, if they don't know how to cope and deal with stress, they don't do as well. Wow, it's probably a good a good system of uh, you know of people around them helping too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, we have another question about oh, what instrument do you use to see a person's brain without cutting them open? Without well, in in for say say if it's related to the going through the nose, you're actually doing it through microscopes or what are called endoscopes. So they make nice tiny fiber optic cameras that look like wires, like your cable wire. And you can then project the image up on a screen and see really detailed, beautiful anatomy. Um, short of that, you get MRIs and images ahead of time. Um, but at the time of the surgery, you either have to open it up or use one of these endoscopes. Okay, I'm trying. I'm not going to say this. Like, I'm just going to try and limit. But that is so cool. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, how nerve-wracking is it when you do surgery on someone while they are awake? Um, for me, it's not very nerve-wracking. In fact, it's more of a comfort because I know they're doing okay. Mm -hmm. If they're asleep, quite honestly, I could theoretically hurt someone. I wouldn't know until hours later when we woke them up. So for me, doing and, and half the reason I do it, it's, it's essentially to make me feel more confident and more comfortable with the surgery. Now, it's a different story for the patient, obviously. And again, and you got that goes back to coping and dealing with stress. Mm -hmm. They have to realize that this is what's going to be best for them, and I talk them through it. Um, so it's a very different experience uh, for them to know that they're conscious and awake and I'm doing my thing back there. Um, but for me, it lets me know that they're fine with all the stuff that I'm doing. Well, has anybody ever fainted just at the, at the thought of it? Like, not uh, patients, patients, no. I haven't had any patients faint or pass out or anything like that. But I do I have lots of students. And, and so it, this certainly isn't for the faint of heart. So, but I, believe it or not, I, I mean, it's... it's only one or two patients got lightheaded or dizzy. Everybody else is kind of like your reaction. It's amazing. It's really neat. Uh, the first brain surgery I ever watched, I was standing and I was totally fascinated. It was someone was removing a tumor and it had no indications and I just fainted. Oh, wow. yep. I, I was thinking how amazing it was, how cool, and then I woke up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Who knows? You're telling your brain one thing and it's, it's doing us something yeah. else. Yeah. Um, we have another question that says, uh, how do you get into the brain? What specific tools do you use? All right. Well, without being too gory, um, first, I mean... I don't want to hear, but no. <laughs> I don't know. It depends on the kids, I guess. But uh, we numb up the skin. So, you know, even when they're asleep and when they wake up afterwards, it's not going to hurt them. Um, mm -hmm. We take a very sharp knife and we have to cut the skin. 
for the bone, we actually use drills. And they got specially made drills, ones that can punch holes, and ones that can saw through the bone without injuring the membrane below it. Mm -hmm. um, around the brain, there's a membrane called the dura. And we use knives and scissors, literally, to cut that open. And we flap that open. And then we expose the brain. And when we're working on the brain, we use something called cautery. We use electricity, more enough, to cauterize the tissue, which melts, melts it. And it helps control bleeding doing it that way. Now, 100 years ago, say a meningioma like the one I showed you, no joke, the doctor would expose it, take their hand, scoop around it, and lift it out. And as you can imagine, a lot of patients didn't do too well. <laughs> I am trying not to freak out. <laughs> That's like trepanation style yeah. craziness. Wow. <laughs> Come a long way. Yes. Um, what are your reasons for choosing this profession? We're going to sort of just uh, jump a little bit back to where and how you got to where you are today. Um, so it was a long progression. I think ever since I was a little kid, I was always fascinated by medicine. I was small for my age and athletic and played with bigger kids and always got hurt. So I was always at the hospital, always seeing doctors, always looked up to them. Um, in college, I was very fascinated by biology and then specifically uh, neuroscience, psychology, psychiatry, you know, um, neuroscience in general. Um, so at that point I was thinking neurology, neurosurgery, psychiatry, something related to that part of the brain, of the body. Um, and then it was just a slow progression from there. Medical school, there's the kind of two tracks. There's medicine and there's surgery I mean, in general. And uh, I like being able to fix things. You know, medicine I found very frustrating. It was nice to be able to diagnose patients, but especially for the neurological conditions, there's only so much you can do um, short of the surgical aspect of, of the neurosciences. So um, I geared towards surgery and one thing led to another with my interests and my skills and boom, you know, 50 million years later I'm a neurosurgeon. <laughs> um, how many years were you in medical school for? So technically it's four years of medical school. I did take one year to do an extra year of research. Um, worked in a, in a neuropathology lab um, doing some more cell death and Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, that kind of research. I was very fascinated by it. We have another one. Let's see. Did you ever faint, puke, or think that this wasn't for you? Never. Um, I, I, I definitely I always just found it fascinating. I never found it gory or scary. Um, in, fa in, in, in high school, I, I, did, um, I, I volunteered on the ambulance squad, the rescue squad, and saw plenty of gory things there. Um, I had a friend that did that with me. He got sick, lightheaded, dizzy. He knew medicine wasn't for him. I had no problem. You know, so I, I was okay with it. What do you do to regulate the stress? Because it seems like, I don't know if it just gets built up over time. I think about this with doctors and surgeons all the time. You must get that fight or flight cortisol rush when you're in a strange situation. So how do you end up combating that even in your daily life? Yeah. Um, again, a lot of I think it's your person. I think one of the biggest determinants of whether you can do something like that is your personality. Okay, mm -hmm. you have to have the right personality, the right coping skills, the right frame of reference, how you view life. Um, in my mind, um, a lot of what I see, it's already bad, and I'm just trying to make it better. So um, uh, it's uh, it, you know it's it's how it's the frame of reference that you put it in. Um, so and we do see traumas and those are very scary and, and those I think are the most stressful. That's literally life and death online. Those people come in the door unlike that brain tumor patient who I felt was very controlled. Uh, someone comes in after a car accident, it's life or death. And in my frame of reference, without me they're going to die. With me I can save them. And and and, uh, and I have the skill set and the confidence in my abilities that in the in the few circum in the unfortunate circumstances when we don't. It's, it's rare where I feel a sense of guilt. Um, we're not perfect, for sure. And this, in retrospect, I rack my brain sometimes. What could I have done differently? Uh, but at the end of the day, you have to realize you are well-trained. Anyone else in that situation, it, it's just a stroke of luck one way or the other. Um, and, uh, and, and that's how I get through it. All right. I, I, I was just wondering. I've been wondering that for a while about surgeons, so thank you. Um, what was your favorite subject in school? Um, hmm. uh, probably, I like science, obviously. I think I, I, I like the sciences and English. I actually liked writing uh, a lot. 
Um, I, I'm much better at learning than creating, though. <laughs> so, so my brother took the, the, the other route. He's the creative one, and uh, he's a writer and illustrator. And um, and and I just kept studying, and uh, and went and followed the sciences. Wow. Well, before you uh, decided you were going to go into the medical field, what kind of jobs did you have that were unrelated to it? So, so not too many. I mean, I was pretty much a student my whole life prior to being a doctor. Um, but I worked in my father's office, did a lot of clerical work. Um, go, well, going way back, I was a paper boy. Right? You know, worked hard and made some money doing that. Um, delivering papers in the snow. Uh, then I worked in my father's office. I worked in a store, did some clerical cashier kind of work. But nothing once I was an adult. Once I was an adult, it was all concentrated on studying and learning. Okay. Well, that makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, we have a question that says, neurosurgery, what places in the body does it involve other than the brain? All right. So a lot of it is the spine. Okay. So, so a lot of people... I, um, as you get older, the spine wears out, degenerates, and so a lot of people get disc herniations or, or joint abnormalities that then push on nerves. So we see a lot of patients with neck pain, back pain, or arm and leg pain if the nerves pinched. Um, when we have traumas, they'll often we'll see broken necks and broken backs. And we have, uh, I think, the, the picture there of the trauma. Yeah, so so this is, if someone has a motor vehicle collision, they get a big whiplash. If you get enough force, you can actually break the neck. And if you break the neck, obviously, that's how you can become paralyzed. So this patient broke the joints between his two vertebrae that then slipped forward. And you can see the, the gray tube in the middle is the spinal cord. And the bone is pushed right up against it. This patient is extremely lucky. Most patients with this kind of fracture are paralyzed. And this patient was perfectly intact. Um, so all we had to do was straighten him out and stabilize him. And uh, not worry, and work, and make sure he didn't develop a problem. And so we were able to, through a couple of physical maneuvers, take the spine that's not lined up and line it back up. And then once we had it lined up, we put screws in the front, screws in the back, and a little bone plug in there to hold it all together. And so this this was a very good outcome. That must feel so good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it must be very rewarding. It's very rewarding. It is. Well, after the surgery, we have another class that says, after the surgery, how do you get the skull back together? <laughs> um, believe it or not, with metal plates and screws. Um, so, yeah, there you go. Um, so if you look at um, this, this is a three-dimensional model of a patient we were monitoring. And if you look at the top, there's these little bars um, that, yep, these little bars that are holding the top of the bone back together to the rest of the skull. And uh, this patient only has those two little bars there, but when, because he was going to be going back to the operating room to take out the electrodes. Um, but we just put those little plates and little four millimeter screws um, connecting the bone removed to the skull, and it stays nice and strong. All right. You just go to the hardware store. <laughs> no. It's just sterilizing. Yeah. Um, what is the craziest foreign object you have taken out of someone's head? Huh. Personally, I haven't seen anything crazy. You see these things online with pitch, with you know forks through the eyes and things like that. That's pretty crazy. I, <laughs> yeah, I've seen yeah, trauma. Else, that's crazy. Yeah, uh, but but what is really remarkable and, and scary? I've had patients that have major traumas, open skull fractures, grass and dirt mixed with the brain, very scary and bad. I've had some gunshot wounds and you pull out bone fragments. Um, I have one interesting story. I had a student um, observing with me. A guy um, shot himself, unfortunately. Mm. Um, he presented to the ER fine, perfectly awake and alert. Um, and, uh, and the CAT scan showed it looked like the bullet was just on the surface of his brain. His, 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 br his bone looked like it had captured almost all of it. We took him to the operating room, and uh, I saw the bullet sticking in the bone just like the round disc, round metal disc hitting the bone. And I was planning on removing all the bone and doing a big craniotomy to remove it. And uh, the student said, can't you just kind of flick that right out of the bone? And I took a curette, and sure enough, it just flicked right out and saved a whole big surgery. <laughs> you, did. you know, you know uh, I'm more of an expert, but you can always learn. <laughs> that, that's pretty funny. Oh, my goodness. We have another question. Um, 
is it true that you can touch a part of the brain with some kind of stimulation and cause memories to be relived? You can. Um, generally, it's not done for memories anymore. Um, but um, there's a famous neurosurgeon named Wilder Penfield, if you look him up, um, in the 1930s up in Canada, he pioneered a lot of the epilepsy surgery that we do now. And he would stimulate the different areas of the brain. And if you stimulate specific areas, mainly on the, in the temporal lobe or very deep, um, you can get memories, songs, and all sorts of details that are just random. Um, but currently, what we do it for is usually we can stimulate, and it's the motor cortex or the language function, their ability to talk and produce words. Um, and uh, so you can actually touch a part of the brain, make the arm jump. You can touch another part of the brain and make the leg jump. Another part, make the face twitch. Um, so it is very anatomically oriented in the brain. It's pretty neat. And is all of that mapped? Someone referred to it to me sometime as the homunculus. Is that a is yeah. that the word that's used? I don't know if you can see that this is. I don't know if you can see the colors on this. Can you mm -hmm. see the colors on this? But yeah, there's a green stripe and a and a, and a purple stripe in the in the front here. And so the motor cortex and the sensory cortex kind of run on as a strip across the brain. And so if you touch right here, that's usually the, the hand right there that would jump. And if you touch right here, that's the face. And if you touch right here, that's the leg. And the more um, motor neurons there are, the more sensory fibers there are, the bigger that area is represented. So yeah, there's something called the homunculus, which is a funny looking cartoon of a person with really big lips, really big tongue, really big hands. Because um, that's where the sensory and motor dexterity is, and they're represented by more, more neurons on the surface of the brain. Oh, wow. Okay. Always wondered that. We have another, and this is a question from Kim and Lacey. Is there any research that you're involved in currently? Do you know them? <laughs> I do know them. <laughs> what, <laughs> what research? <laughs> um, and, 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 and currently, I'm not doing research. So right now, I have a purely clinical practice. Um, the closest I come to research now is just clinical outcomes. So we're a relatively small hospital doing relatively complex surgery, um, and especially the epilepsy surgery that we do. Um, patients um, are often socially and physically isolated in where, in where they live. And traveling to a big center, like you know where I am, they'd have to travel two and a half hours to University of Virginia or three hours to Hopkins. Um, or three hours to West Virginia University, and, and they can't do that. They don't have the financial or the social resources to travel. Um, and technically, these surgeries, like I said, we have the skill set. You know, local surgeons do brain tumors and other complex things. Um, it's surgery that's been performed for almost 100 years. Walter Penfield was doing it, you know, in the 1930s. Um, so, but what we do here is not very commonly done in our size hospital. So we are accumulating our data, and we have very excellent outcomes. And publishing that and sharing that with the neurosurgery and the neurology community um, can help other areas kind of develop this and grow this, um, so it can help more patients. Well, how? What do you? What do you attribute your really great number of outcomes from epilepsy patients? What do you attribute that to? Because it's well above the national average. Yeah. So it's, it's a lot of factors. A lot of it's just patient selection. So a lot of patients, they go to the Hopkins and UVA. I mean, they're seeing the worst of the worst patients. Very complex. They're desperate. And it's just hard for anybody to fix. And some of them just aren't fixable. Um, so we have very, we, you know, very selective patients. Um, I have a partner, Dr. Lyons, who's a fantastic, fantastic epilepsy neurologist. And so by the time we, they come to me, he's fairly confident we can localize where those seizures are coming from. He's done enough of the clinical background. To, to pick these patients. Um, and then um, when it comes down to doing the surgeries, you know, obviously I think I'm technically pretty good. I do pretty aggressive surgeries. Um, and uh, and that don't just take, if there's a small area we think the seizures are coming from, I do a little more work around it um, just to be safe. And, uh, and yeah, the patients have done great. Yeah, in reference to all of your surgeries, we want to know how, someone wants to know how many brain surgeries you've done in your career. Hmm. I do not know. <laughs> um, like, in a, like a wall where you... Yeah, yeah. Stop. In residency, we do, have to, we do have to count how many cases we do. And part of our training, um, becoming board certified, you have to tally your cases and your outcomes and, 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 uh, and do a certain volume. So at, at a certain point, you become expert at it. 
Um, so in my residency training at, at Duke where I trained, um, we did upwards of you know, up close to 1,000 cases overall a year. You know, that's a six-year wow. training program. So, and then I've been out in practice for nine years. Now, I'm not doing near the volume that we did in training, but hundreds and hundreds. Wow. Well, we have uh, time for maybe just one more question. I was just wondering what you would have everybody know about your job that you maybe think that I haven't asked or they haven't asked, something that you might think they might like to know. Huh. <laughs> maybe something that people think about it if yeah. that isn't true or... I would say, I mean, so people often say it's not brain surgery or it's not rocket science, right? Um, so I would say they're two very different things. Rocket science, to me, you have to be intellectually brilliant. Brain surgery, you don't have to be intellectually brilliant. It's more of a personality. You have to be smart, obviously. You have to acquire the skill sets. You have to be patient, like we talked about. You have to be empathetic with patients. Um, you, you, there's a lot of skills you have to have, but I think it's more of a personality, being able to deal with the stress, deal with the trauma, deal with patients, deal with families, be confident, deal with when things don't go right. Um, so I think it's just more of a, a strong personality set as opposed to an intellectual uh, set. Very, that is very interesting because I wouldn't, that would not be something I would think of. In Mrs. Cole's class, I have one more question. After performing a long surgery, do you get some time off? Uh, it's I wish. <laughs> um, it, you know, it depends on wh where you are in your practice and 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 what you do. Um, I choose my schedule to some degree, but th there there's always need. And what happens when we take vacations? The schedule gets backlogged and pay, you know, and it gets busier when you come back. So you just have to find that balance. So so we keep it pretty busy. All right. Well, unfortunately, we are all out of time. We thank you so much for coming and sharing all of this with us. That's my pleasure. Had fun. Well, this is the last event uh, of this school year, so we just wanted to say thank you to everyone who's watched, and thank you for all of our experts who have come on and given great interviews. We look forward to starting up again in the fall, so after the rest of the school year and after an awesome summer, we'll see you then. But until then... For Jason Learning, I'm Haley Nelson. We'll see you next time on Jason Live.